I was talking to my husband about how excited I was about this debate, but also how it's challenging to kick off a debate like this. Um, partially because you should think of something funny to say at the beginning. And he was telling me, you know, you really want to be careful when you're making jokes about socialism and capitalism, but socialism in particular. And I said, why? And he said, well, if you're making jokes about socialism, it's only funny if everyone gets it. <laughs> <laughs> But it is actually a really serious debate, and I think it is something that's defining right now for our culture and for this particular political moment, and it's something that young people have unique bearing on. So your generation and mine, uh, the Millennials and Gen Z, uh, make up 37% of the electorate in 2020, and we are completely polarized about socialism versus capitalism. Um, I was looking at statistics today on this. Axios Pool found that in 18 to 24 year olds, 61% were favorable towards socialism, 58% favorable toward capitalism. Um, so there is some overlap there, which I found weird. But uh, I wanted to start this off by getting a sense of where this audience stands. We're going to do this toward the end of the debate as well. Um, I'm going to give you three options here uh, socialism, capitalism, or undecided. And I'll just have you raise your hand. Uh, say the one that you feel um, most open to or, or best identifies you. So on socialism, who have we got? Okay, capitalism. Oh, <laughs> you probably work that out for you. And uh, who's undecided? Okay, great. Um, well, to kick this off, I'm going to have our two speakers uh, begin with an eight minute opening statement. They'll have a chance to respond to each other. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions. And then we'll open it up to audience questions, too. So be, be thinking about something that you want to ask. Uh, please make sure that it is a question and not a speech or a debate yourself. Uh, but I'm, I'm really eager to hear what you have for the craft to contribute. So we'll, we'll kick it off. You want to take it first? Sure. Well, thank you all for, for coming. Um, the turnout is quite good. I was not this interested in anything when I was in college. Um, I actually started Jack when it was in college, but I wouldn't go out to an event at 610 when, you know, there was other things to be doing. Uh, it's still nice outside. It's still neat. Uh, but uh, okay, leave. So, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm 30 years old now. I just turned 30 this summer. And I became a socialist when I was 14 or 15. You know, way too young to be making this kind of lifelong decisions. But I'm stubborn, so I stuck with it. And at the time, when I was a teenager and I would tell people I was a socialist, it would, it would prompt a lot of flurry of... Of, of questions, sometimes disdain, sometimes whatever. It was just general confusion. Uh, now, I think, in part because of Bernie Sanders and AOC and the general climate of the country, people are just saying, yes, yeah, sure, you know, leave me alone. So it's, it's good that you're here for the, for, the, uh, for the conversation. So fundamentally, the socialist vision is, at a minimum, the idea that everyone deserves certain basic rights. And these basic rights, these foundations of, of being a free individual, uh, should be provided to us uh, as social rights and not things that are captive to the market or captive to our ability to pay. So your housing, your health care, your education, uh, your child care, your access to basic nutrition, you know, these are things that we need in order to reach our potential, in order to be free individuals. So a socialist mentality isn't necessarily an anti-liberal mentality. So it's not a mentality that says that, oh, you know, free speech, this is a bourgeois right. No, free speech and these other rights are rights that we're struggling for, we're won, and need to be defended. But what the socialist says isn't that these are fake rights compared to the real rights of your right to eat. The socialist says that these are rights that can only be truly reached if it's combined with other guarantees. Like, for example, the guarantee to a strong public education that allows people to be um, literate, to engage fully as, as citizens in a free press. So a country like India, for instance, which has a huge percentage of the population that's functionally illiterate, this is a country that we op oppose their system, not because it has these basic liberal democratic rights, which we respect and doesn't exist in, in every country in the world, but because it doesn't fully, fully realize it. So at the very least, 
It's about creating this bedrock of decommodified social goods. So social goods taken out of the market and enjoyed as rights, at the very least, as a last, a last stopping point. Now, beyond that, socialists question the way the society is structured. We question the fact that we live in, essentially, tyrannies in the workplace. Now, tyranny doesn't mean that it's, it's a completely miserable place. It doesn't mean that your workplace is necessarily, you know, uh, Dickensian, um, uh, like, terrible sweatshop or something like that. What it means, though, is that you're in your workplace from 9 to 5, and you're in a society that tells you that, at best, 9 to 5, that, that tells you that democracy is a right, but within the workplace, you don't have any democratic resource. You, you have no rights. Your employment contract is a contract, of course, that you freely enter into, but it's a worker star choice that put you into that employment contract. Because essentially, under capitalism, workers and capitalists, so the people who have to work for a living and the people who owns the uh, facilities that produces goods and services the rest of us have to, have to work at, are dependent on each other. Your boss certainly needs your labor, your contribution, to, to his or her workplace. But you need your grocery money. And chances are, your boss needs your individual contribution to the labor process more than you, um, uh, you need your, um, uh, less than you need um, your uh, grocery money, your, your way to pay your rent, and so on. So what a socialist says, essentially, is that we need to democratize this fair of society. So in addition to guaranteeing a certain set of rights that allow us to be free individuals, to, to maximize our, our individual potential. We also need to create structures in which there's more democratic participation and deliberation. So for example, in a workplace, we might still need to have markets. Markets existed before capitalism, though I might you exist after capitalism. But we don't necessarily need workplaces structured as carriers where bosses and managers aren't elected by, by their workers. So socialists, in other words, think about what capitalists potentially contribute to the production process. So obviously in the propaganda of old, we would say, well, capitalists are mere parasites. They contribute nothing. They just take from the sweat of the worker. Well, in fact, capitalists in this current system contribute in vital ways to the way our society is structured. For one, capitalists take entrepreneurial risk to start new ventures where goods and services are produced and where people are employed. And to the extent that we have a welfare state, we have it because we're taxing those, those ventures. Capitalists also contribute as managers. They're convening, they're helping to, to arrange production, more often than not, especially in smaller firms. The socialist argument isn't that the capitalist contributes nothing. It's that what the capitalist does can, in fact, be replicated by the free association of workers. So you in your workplace could decide to elect your own management. Instead of just taking home a flat wage, you could take home a share. You could take on, on, on dividends out of, out of profits. So in a sense, what we're suggesting is not a decline in, in ownership and participation, but a society that's a true ownership society. A society in which every single person has this democratic state in civil society and in democracy, is guaranteed a bedrock of rights to their society, but also has a stake in their place of work, where they're not just be, being treated like replaceable cogs in a machine, where they're able to participate in deliberations and discussions and so on. Does this mean untrammeled democracy at every single level? No. In certain large firms, you elect your management, and certain decisions are made on the principles of representative democracy. You can't vote on every single decision that a business makes day to day. At smaller firms, maybe you can have higher levels of direct democracy. In the same way, within civil society, we want to expand the rights of ordinary people to be democratic actors, but it doesn't mean that my right to speech, my right to all these other bedrock rights should be decided by votes. You know, what we essentially are looking for is a society that reaches social democracy, what has been accomplished in Nordic countries and elsewhere, countries which, unlike the United States, don't have children dying at, at, at from at, you know, higher rates of infant mortality than other major countries, countries that don't have people struggling with huge amounts of debt just to get an education, countries that treats and rewards people for their efforts and guarantees a bedrock of rights, 
I think we want to take this logic of social democracy and extend it further into our workplace. We don't want a year zero break with the present. We want a society in which ordinary people can reach their potential. We want to fulfill, in other words, the promise of the Enlightenment, the promise of liberty, equality, and solidarity. This promise has been made possible by the riches of capitalism, by the riches of all this abundance in the last two, three hundred years. We now, from this starting point, no longer have to structure our societies in such a way that, that um, oppresses uh, a few and allows um, you know, people to, to accumulate their wealth from the labor and work of others. All right. So it's always good uh, in a debate to define your terms. So let me tell you what I think capitalism is, or what capitalism actually is, and what I think socialism is, and why I think one is a moral and practical system, and the other is immoral and impractical. Capitalism is a system of freedom. Now, freedom is a tricky word, because everybody's full of freedom, right? I could be in front of a group of Marxists, and everybody raised their hand. I, I mean, we just know that socialism is a system of freedom. But what does freedom mean? What does freedom mean? Again, definitions. Freedom means the absence of coercion. Freedom means the absence of authority. Freedom means the absence of a gun to put your head where you're told what to do. Whether it's in the name of the proletarian, in the name of your race, in the name of the majority, in the name of Donald Trump, it doesn't matter. A gun to put your head, coercion, force, authority of the church, authority of the state, is anti-freedom. Freedom means the absence of coercion. Capitalism is a system that systematizes the absence of coercion. It eliminates coercion from society by protecting the rights of individuals. Now, what are rights? Wow, we have to define all these things. Rights are freedoms of action. Not freedom of action sanctioned by a majority. Not freedom of action sanctioned by politicians or sanctioned by the authorities. Not freedom of action sanctioned by the church, but freedom of action sanctioned by you as an individual. My tired. My tired. Then people saying it's too loud and uh, the, the, all right, we'll find a middle ground. I yell, I call it. <laughs> the tyranny I'm, of the microphone. The tyranny of the microphone. <laughs> your freedom, your freedom to choose your values using your mind in pursuit of your happiness. That's what capitalism allows. It leaves you free. Free from coercion of other people. Free to pursue your life. Free to choose what path to take for yourself. That's the moral foundation of capitalism. That's why capitalism is moral, because it leaves individuals free to use their mind in pursuit of their own happiness, their own values, which is the ultimate purpose of life. Not to sacrifice for others, not to live for the group, not to live for the collective, but to live for you as an individual, to make your life the best life that it can be, to pursue your individual happiness. Capitalism makes that possible by leaving you free. What you do with it is up to you. And some people don't do much with it, but what you do with it is up to you, and you have the freedom to do with it. So, your values, your choices, that's what capitalism is about. And as a consequence of being moral, it is also the practical system. I mean, one of the things that amazes me about capitalism versus socialism debates is that we're having them. I mean, this is over. To the extent that capitalism has been tried, to the extent that it's been tried, anywhere in the world, at any point in time in the world, it produces freedom and enormous wealth to, for people. Everyone, including in Scandinavia, by the way, where they have elements of capitalism, and those elements are what produce the wealth that they then, you know, steal and redistribute. And we can talk about Scandinavia later. But it works. It's worked everywhere. Now, my vision of capitalism, a society with no coercion, has never existed. And certainly in the United States today, we do not live under a capitalist system. This is a mixed economy, lots of coercion, 
lots of interference, lots of authorities, lots of people voting to redistribute other people's wealth, lots of regulation of businesses and the government and central planners telling us what to produce, how to produce, when to produce it, how much to pay employees, when to pay them, you know, what benefits to give them. There's no end to the amount of control government has today on the economy, less than what some would like. But what we have today is no capitalism. What we have today is a mixed economy, elements of control, elements of statism, elements of some socialism, and some private property, some businessmen making decisions for themselves, but usually heavily, heavily controlled. That's capitalism. And the more we expand it, the more we allow it, the more we let individual minds free, the richer we get, the better the quality of life, the better life is. The more we strain it, the more we can strain it, the slower economic growth, the less wealth is created, the poorer we all become. And it's simple. What is the source of wealth? Now again, Marxists typically argue that the source of wealth is labor. No. The source of wealth is the human mind. The source of wealth is ideas. The source of wealth is entrepreneur, not because he takes risks, not because he deploys capital, but because he has an idea and he is able to deploy that idea. And I know, I know it's hard to understand what CEOs do, and it's hard to understand what capitalists do, and it's hard to understand what entrepreneurs do. But, you know, it's, if, you, if you've ever worked in a startup, if you've ever worked in a large company, you know that the, the laborers, the workers, particularly those who use their hands, need the managers a thousand times more than the manager needs to work. Because without the manager, without the idea, without the organization, without the talent to put together global supply chains, which require massive amounts of talent, this idea that workers can just elect somebody and they can just go and do it, is bizarre. But let me quickly define socialism. Socialism, in my view, is either the state or workers' control of the means of production, control of our lives control of the choices we make in the economic realm. And this idea that you can somehow separate the social and intellectual realm from the, from the material uh, uh, property rights realm is bizarre. If you don't have property rights, you don't have any rights. Property rights are just one manifestation of individual rights and a manifestation of that freedom of action. But if you're free to act, to produce, to create, then you have to be free to keep the product of your labor. And if you can't keep your product of your labor, you have no rights. And you have no right to life, and therefore all other rights are up for a vote. Why limit it? Why cherry pick which rights we're going to have and which rights we don't? I believe we have all the rights that are required for human beings to survive. Free speech, but, free, but property, the right to property, because it's a requirement of human life. But I've got 30 seconds, so I'll just say this. Socialism is immoral. It's immoral because it sacrifices an individual to the collective. It's immoral because it violates the rights of the individual in every respect. It places the tyranny of the mob, the tyranny of the majority, over the individual. It denies minority rights. There's only one real minority, the smallest minority, and that's the individual. Socialism rejects that and denies that and suppresses that and stomps all over the individual. And it's immoral. And as a consequence, it's also impractical, and I'm not going to give you the litany of all the failures of socialism, maybe we'll have an opportunity later, I, I'd love to, but uh, from, from, from uh, the Soviet Union to China to Venezuela today, it is one, to the kibbutz, oh, yeah, one yeah. disaster after another. You're out of time. Yeah. Sorry. So, let me talk to you for a Well, I, I think, who here has worked in a workplace, any, any form of work? Okay, have you, been, have you been exposed to coercion at work? In other words, have you had to take a job and had to work under terms and conditions set by someone else? Now, you could say that the contract was a fair contract that you entered into, but there's obviously coercion involved in any form of production. In particular, though, the capitalist form of production is a form of production in which many people who have wealth and have power are able to maintain their wealth and power over other people who have to work for them. This, to me, is coercion. Now, it's a form of exploitation, too. Exploitation doesn't necessarily mean um, it's a pejorative thing in all, in all uh, forms, 
So I assume every single capitalist on the planet, even someone as, I think we both think as odious as, as Donald Trump, uh, opposes chattel slavery. Now, if you're opposed to chattel slavery, you might be in favor of wage labor. You might not consider that a reprehensible force of exploitation, but the dynamics of having your conditions of life determined by someone else is, is the same in the sense that you do not, it's a contract signed under duress. It's obviously capitalism has created wealth and it's created uh, abundance. But the question is, can you not recreate forms of wealth and, and abundance and, and innovation dynamism from worker-owned firms? You have to make a case that management by a manager who has their power or an owner who has their power by virtue of owning private property, a priority, is necessarily better than management decided democratically by people at a workplace. In my experience, the people at a workplace actually know how to, how to make things at every level from design to implementation. I mean, you can take the concept and, I guess, use it any way you want, right? But what does that mean? Coercion means something. When somebody engages into a contract voluntarily, that is not coercion. You might say, I didn't want to do that contract, but you still chose to do it. And the fact is that capitalism is the only and first system in all of human history that's given us choices. What choices did we have before capitalism? One, live on a farm, grow the food that you ate, and die in your thirties, and most of your children dead. Capitalism has liberated us to have choices. We have multiple employment opportunities, we have multiple educational opportunities. We can choose our destiny. The idea that, that owners and managers curse workers is to eliminate, to, to make coercion a meaningless concept. Coercion means force. Coercion means putting a gun to your head. If when, you, when you violate the law, the government comes and takes you to jail. Government can't do that. I, I, companies can't do that. Government is force. Its very nature is force. And the diff what is happening here is as a, a, we're conflating two types of power, economic power and political power. The essence of political power is force, is coercion, is a gun. You have no choice but to follow the law. You have no choice but to do what you are told to do. Otherwise, you go to jail. Economic power is fundamentally voluntary. You don't have to buy an iPhone. You don't have to go to company X. You can go work for company Y. Or you can go to school and study and do something else. You have the choice in your hand. You are, in other words, free. Capitalism provides you with freedom. Socialism provides you with the kind of slavery that tells you through a majority, what you must do, and how you must do it, how much you get paid, and what are your working conditions. Voluntary choice is out. All right, well, one thing I'm interested to hear from both of you, it, it sounds like both of you think that you're not currently in the system you'd like to be in. So uh, I'm, I'm curious what you think the transition to either socialism or capitalism looks like. Well, what I mean by democratic socialism isn't just a socialism that has doses of, of socialism within capitalism. It's a socialism that's after capitalism. And that hasn't been successfully implemented. That hasn't been implemented anywhere in the world. What we do know, though, is that following the logic of collective action, social democracies have, have arose. And the logic of collection, collective action is as follows. So this unequal relationship, called portion, called something else, exists in the workplace, in that the average worker as an individual can't go to your boss and say, give me a $20 raise or an hour, I'm going to go stop working the CVS and go to this right down the street, they're going to say, okay, goodbye, go. Um, but collectively, you can get together with 20, 30 of your employees, uh, your fellow co-workers, and if you go to that boss, you can make make a, a different sort of bargain. You can use your power, your ability to withdraw your labor, from, from work, and you can even up the odds. Right? Collective action is difficult. So you're taking this dependency that you have with your boss, and you're evening up the odds. That's the logic of creating unions. And then now we have to take these individual isolated unions, we need to band them together. So you create a union federation. But then you need to express your power, and you need to get certain laws and certain rights and strive at the state 
state level. So then you create a political party, a labor-based or social democratic political party. In the case of Scandinavia and many countries in Northern Europe, there were periods of decades and decades where parties built on this logic, this logic of collective action for the workers' movement, governed and governed successful states. They governed states that had a decommodified sector, in other words, social rights for healthcare and education and so on. So in the same way that some of our geniuses in the United States, some of our greatest talents, or even our mediocre talents, will never get the chance to reach their potential, you had a better chance of doing that. And in the same way, we have tremendous disparity at every level, from racial to, to gender to, to just on the, the basis of your zip code. That didn't exist in the same way, it still existed, it didn't exist in the same way in these other, these other countries. So that's what I, what, I, what, I, what I believe is a model that has worked. Yes, it was fundamentally trying to take, and yes, coerce, a, a, a capitalist system towards certain outcomes. It was using regulations, but particularly the power of sectoral bargaining to shape capitalist outcomes. But the logic of it was a logic rooted in collective action and rooted in the workers' movement and rooted, yes, in socialist ideology. That succeeded. Can we build beyond social democracy into a form of worker ownership? That's an open question. I would like to get to a social democracy and let's, let's find out. And if it doesn't work, the people won't be for it and it'll be, it'll be rolled back. In Sweden, there were attempts to, to use the logic of, of, of collective action to go beyond social democracy, institute forms to the minor plan and these other, these other plans to institute forms of, of collective um, ownership. It, it, it never was fully pursued, but that's, that's my logic. I have no problem embracing the good and bad of, of, of socialism, saying what I disagree with, authoritarian forms of socialism as I disagree with, saying the, the flawed parts of the Scandinavian models I agree with, because I think if we have the no-true Scotsman mentality, it just becomes a semantic thing, where anything good isn't real socialism, anything bad isn't real socialism, and everything good is that that's the only real socialism. And I think uh, sometimes people who are, are pro-capitalist fall in the same, same um, you know, step, because anything bad in this society, they say it's not because it's, it's because it's not capitalist enough, and, and so on. It makes it difficult to have a conversation. Do I get a comment to that, or, or to... I, I actually, I, I would like you to, first of all... I, um, I'd, I'd like you to, first of all, talk about how you think the tradition of capitalism, as you see it, would work from what we have right now. And then I'm going to let you guys respond to each other's. Well, I think, the, I think the trajectory towards capitalism is a hard one, much harder than I think the, the trajectory towards socialism, because I think the world, uh, in spite of all my efforts, the world is moving more towards socialism than it is towards capitalism. The general agreement is that socialism is a good, that coercion is good, that force is good, that forcing people to behave in a particular way that you want them to behave is right. I, I, the idea that force, coercion, forcing somebody to do something they don't want is wrong, morally, and should never be exercised. That idea is not a popular idea. Um, I, I think the only way to move us towards capitalism is a, a, a real educational campaign challenging the philosophical foundation of the existing system that we have. The existing system, the existing system of thought that we have. The idea, the moral idea that your purpose in life is to live towards others. The moral idea that the collective is more important than the individual. The moral idea that the state is above all. That we see on the democratic side and on the republican side. That we see in politics across the entire spectrum. Those things have to be challenged. Until we're willing to challenge collectivism and moral altruism. Until we're willing to, to embrace the morality of individualism and a, and a political system of individualism, uh, a political system that elevates the freedom of the individual, that is built around freedom for the individual, I don't see how capitalism comes about. I think you see in the West movements to move towards a, a little bit more free, free markets. But then as soon as, as soon as they fix up things a little bit and the economy starts going again and people feel comfortable, they immediately bounce back towards socialism. You saw that with Reagan and the bounce back, you saw that with Thatcher and the bounce back. Because neither Reagan nor Thatcher challenged the fundamental beliefs that are required in order to build a capitalist society. And those are, are, are deeply rooted and they are philosophical and they require changes at the university level and changing in young people's thinking. And I see that move towards capitalism, towards my vision, as much harder, much more challenging. Uh, and much more educational than political. I don't like political, like, because politics is what? Politics is force. 
But think about that that eats at you, that this guy is lazy and he's going home early. This is exactly what happened on the kibbutz. And you work very hard. And you start resenting him. And you start hating him. Every time I see socialist, socialism, what you see is malevolent toward other people, resentment, hatred, because it creates envy, rivalry, and hatred because it's a zero-sum world. I don't get paid for what I produce. I get paid what was negotiated, what was voted on, what people agree. Not based on my productivity. And somebody else might get paid exactly the same as I do, even though they're a lot less productive. That's what collective action does. And that's why unions are in decline. Unions are in decline because union members don't want to be in unions. Because it doesn't make any sense for them, particularly in the modern era, where they can negotiate salaries for themselves. Unions in decline because manufacturing jobs, you know, physical labor is in decline because of technology, because of robots, because of computers. And no software engineer, no software engineer, which who is an employee, wants a union to represent them. You know, are, are they going to be able to bounce around from company to company like they do in Silicon Valley, bidding themselves their, their, their salary up every time they do it? No. Not under socialism, you can't do any of that. So this conversation seems to be shaping up to be a lot about coercion. So I want to ask you both a question perspective of your, your preferred economic system about coercion. So I'll start with you, Yarn. Um, one thing that I hear is a critique of capitalism is that if you pit economic interests against each other, that there is an incentive for businesses to get government on their side and use that coercion against their competition. <coughs> And the question when we're talking about transitioning to a purely capitalist system from the mix that we have right now is do the really big companies already have the advantage yeah. that they could wield that power uh, against smaller businesses and against entrepreneurs in a way that there's no coming back from? So let me be clear, uh, you know, cronyism, which is what you're describing, is a feature of statism. It's a feature of systems like socialism. It's not a feature of capitalism. If you have a complete separation of state from economics, Businesses don't lobby the state because the state has no power, no goodies to give them. It's only because the state has power, has resources, has favors to give businesses. Do you get the lobby? Do you get the manipulation? Do you get the cronyism? And then it develops into protecting them from themselves from, from others. So if, if we talk about the transition, my first, if I were president, God forbid, um, <laughs> The first thing I would do is pass an anti cronyism law. And it would be very simple. Zero subsidies, zero corporate taxes, which are stupid taxes. If you know anything about economics, corporations don't pay taxes. You pay the taxes. All taxes on consumption taxes, uh, all corporate taxes, consumption taxes or labor taxes. So employees and consumers pay all corporate taxes. So zero corporate taxes. So you can't give any loopholes and favors there. Zero. Uh, subsidies and dramatic reduction in regulation across the board. So every year I would eliminate 25% of the regulations on the book on the books. And once the state is separated from economic power, this lobbying goes away. And I'll give you one quick story about this. In the early 1990s, the largest corporation in the world based on market capitalization was Microsoft. How much money did Microsoft spend in those years lobbying Washington? Well, the exact figure is zero. Largest company in the world did no chromism, no lobby, no law firm, no building, nothing in DC. They had no presence in DC, nothing. And they came from Congress. Congress invited them in. Invited. Whenever Congress does, there's an invitation, right? There's a gun there saying, you better come. They came in and they sat in front of a Senate committee headed by a Republican, a young Alan Hatch from Utah, and Alan Hatch stood up and he yelled at him and he said, you better be here in Washington, D.C. You have to build buildings here. You have to have higher lawyers. In other words, you have to love, you have to bribe me. Now, you can't say that in America, so you, you, you culture in other terms. I mean, you can find this. This is all well documented. And Microsoft said, you know what? You leave us alone, we leave you alone. We're not interested. And they went home and they continued to devote exactly zero dollars to lobby. Six months later, several months later, knock on the door. We're here from the Justice Department. And you violated antitrust laws. And we're coming after you. You remember what the violation was? Anybody know what Microsoft did that is so evil that they had to be harassed for over 10 years? 
by the Justice Department. Anybody know? They gave away something for free. A browser. I remember downloading Netscape for seven bucks. You guys, you can, can you believe you had to pay for a browser? You don't pay for anything. Everything's free in this economy. It's pretty amazing. And they gave it away for free. And that was an antitrust revolution. And they had it. Guess how much money Microsoft spends today on lobbying? Tens of millions of dollars. If you go downtown DC, about equal distance from the White House and Congress, they have a beautiful building. They've got massive numbers of lawyers. Because they realize that Washington won't leave them alone. So they better fight back. So you want to get rid of cronyism? Get rid of government intervention. All right, so Bhaskar, here's my question to you about coercion. We're talking about literal transfer of ownership, uh, violation of property rights in a way. And I guess my question for you is, um, what, what happens when a business owner says, no, I don't want to give this company up to workers? Well, I, I think that, that we have to separate between private property rights and personal property rights. And I think that... Can you clarify that for me? So, so, so in other words, your right to own a car, own a toothbrush, own whatever, whatever else, own a home, this is not a right that impinges on the rights of, of other people. Now, if we say that the workplace is the sole domain that because of private property rights, it belongs to the capitalists and the capitalists alone, like, like, you, would, like you would say, then the terms and conditions of work are just up to the, the capitalists and whatever internal power dynamic of, of pressure, and so there's still going to be a battle of, of industrial conflict that's going to go on between workers demanding certain things and capitalists demanding other things. By the way, a lot of those, those programmers are going, to, are going to see in the next 20, 30 years as they get de-skilled, like, like, is it, like it's already happening. Uh, they might want a union really badly in 10, 15 years as they go from artisans to, to just regular workers like the rest of us. Now, all of this involves taking and enshrining certain rights these workers have, or, or taking a victory in, in one union contract and applying it across the sector, for instance, this implies an erosion of, of property rights. Now, if, if there are certain sectors that I will admit right away, in the snap of a finger, I do want to take away from private hands and put into public hands, not even necessarily the hands of, of workers, but the hands of the state. There's limited sectors. There's natural monopolies, right? I think that would make sense. There's the health insurance industry, which I think vitally, as a moral imperative within the next five years, we need to take as a, from a commodified sphere and bring through a Medicare for All system it into, into the public as a, as a right. Now, what happens if the CEOs of this companies, these companies say no? Well, they don't have the right to, they have the right to contest the ruling. They have the right to, to use, use law to contest the uh, the judicial system to contest an expropriation, but I, I think that there are certain sectors where we don't want uh, the private private sector, and we have in the past taken sectors away from the private sector and brought them to the public sector. I mean, the New York City subway system. One reason why uh, it's so difficult to maintain is because it's essentially the amalgamation of three or four different private subway lines. They all had different tokens. They all had different cars. They all had different different types of tracks. I think. Even most defenders of the existing capitalist system would say, yeah, public transit is something that the state should probably do because it allows people to move around and, and exchange goods and services. And I think in that case, yes, it was an expropriation, but it was done lawfully and it was done in a transparent way and it was done by rule of law. It's not something where some sort of leader struts around and points at something and says expropriate this, don't expropriate this, I know this person. No, it has to be done in such a way that it's governed by certain, certain principles. But we are for and most people are for all sorts of intrusions on the rights of private property. We just believe in democratically setting what these limits are and in what way we want to intrude on these, these rights. Most people agree with a eight-hour day. Most people agree that there's certain recourses and people shouldn't be fired on the basis of their gender or race or whatever else. Most people agree on this. And these are coercions. All right. Um, so I want to shift a little can bit. Can, we, can I comment? Sure. Um, <laughs> Who's we? I mean, notice that we are going to decide who gets to keep their property and who doesn't get to keep their property. We are going to decide if you get to keep your toothbrush or not. We are going to decide which workplaces are okay to be privately owned and which workplaces are not okay. We are going to decide. In other words, the rule of the mob, the rule of the majority is going to decide. And, and I, again, I don't see 
Why does we stop from private property? Why can't we decide to kill Socrates? We said we haven't asked. But, but property rights are essential. Without property rights, without the entrepreneurs, without the owners of property, there is no industry. This is a fantasy and a joke. There is no and no example in history of a system that can work, even on a small scale, that can work when we, by vote, decide what iPhone to produce. I mean, imagine what this would look like if the committee designed it. Imagine what this would look like if we voted on it. I know how I vote, it wouldn't look this pretty. I mean, you, it's, it's insanity to think that you can run any kind of business, even a small grocery store, never mind a complex supply chain, a uh, global supply chain business, on the basis of voting and on the basis of public opinion and on the basis of coercion, because the we, the we, the whole point of the we is to coerce the individual. The whole point of the we is to tell the individual what they can and cannot do in the realm of property, right? You can speak all you want, can you? If I, if I don't have property, if I don't own the microphone, if you don't let me own the microphone, can I speak? Is there a relationship, I wonder, between private property and freedom of speech? Of course there is. But all rights are eviscerated once you eviscerate the right to property. And once you place the we above the individual. And that is the real danger. The individual becomes a cog. The individual becomes a sacrificial animal. The individual becomes a, somebody to be exploited and expropriated at will. That's what socialism is about. Socialism is not, doesn't care about who is an individual. It cares about the group, about the we, about the majority, and the majority in any particular situation is going to be different. But there's a couple of just very quick misnomers. Now, first of all, well, if you want to look at even the success of cooperatives within, within capitalism, well, the fourth or fifth largest business in the corporation in the entirety of Spain is run on this, this basis, uh, the Mondragon uh, Collective. Now, on the case of, yes, should, should an iPhone, should a commodity be produced with direct democracy at every level? No, what I'm proposing is a system in which worker-owned firms, so there is ownership, but it's, it's collective, and it's regulated just like every other market economy, and yes, just like every capitalism will always be regulated. I don't think we're living in a, in a mixed a, a, a economy in the way he describes it. I think we're living in a socialist, uh, in a capitalist economy that's been chastened in certain key ways. So yes, of course there'll have to be firm failures and there'll have to be innovations. And of course, there's limits to the things that we can decide through democracy. I think there's a role for, for markets in, in, in consumer goods. I don't think there's a, a need or a role for the, a market in necessarily in that and uh, uh, provision of, of healthcare and other basic social goods. So I think there is, is a difference there. But, but the key is, when we say, as socialists, that, that there are certain collective rights that belong to people, of course, when I say it now, it's just rhetoric. That these are rights that people will need to deliberate upon. They'll need to democratically enshrine. And yes, like any right in any just democratic system, it's a right that can be rolled back. You know, we can enhance... Uh, through our democratic deliberative processes, the rights of the state providing guarantees over, over the provision of child care or over the provision of health care. Uh, then, eight years later, we could say, oh, this system isn't working, it's more inefficient, we want to go back to the private system and we can roll it back. I mean, that's the way any just society works. And am I suggesting a year zero leap into the unknown? No. Certain principles exist. How do we regulate speech? Something like the clear and present, present danger seems like a good way to regulate what state interference in speech should be in a, in a social society. I don't think social jurisprudence would be spun full cloth out of whatever else. What I'm proposing is taking what works in our society, because it's filled with people who want to live in a more just place, and it's filled with many wonders and abundance and whatnot, and providing a base level of guarantees and deepening our democratic participation in society. So we don't have a class of people that have are traveling and are in Davos and they're around making decisions that affect everyone else, but the rest of us are accountable to corporate bureaucracies. Libertarians and, and others close to them are just so obsessed with state bureaucracies, they can't see how much of their lives are dependent and decided by corporate bureaucracies and boardrooms, most of us will never get the chance to be in the same building as much less enter. All right, well, I'm going to open it up to audience Q&A in just a moment, but I did want to ask you one more question, and I'd like your responses to it to be somewhat short, so we can open it up. 
But um, so let's try to keep it maybe a minute or two. But uh, I would like both of you to answer whether or not you think income inequality, economic inequality, in and of itself is a bad thing. So, yeah, so, no, I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if it's generated in a free market, I think the only, the only situation in which income inequality is a bad thing is when it's a consequence of coercion, when it's a consequence of either cronyism, which is not part of capitalism, which is anti-capitalism. Uh, it's, it's a part of every socialist system and every, every state system. Uh, or it's a part of redistribution of wealth. So I believe that any wealth you own is, 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 you should own. If you own a lot of wealth because you produce a huge amount of value, then you own a lot of wealth, huge amount of value. I don't envy, uh, I don't envy billionaires. I actually cherish billionaires. I think billionaires are fantastic. They've created a much better world for me. And I think that's wonderful that we have all the products that they've created. They've changed the world. So I don't think inequality is a problem at all. And I think when we conflate when we talk about inequality, is income and wealth inequality, which I think is relevant both economically and morally, with political inequality. Uh, political equality is crucial. Uh, you know, all men are created equal was not a statement about income or wealth, it was a statement about rights. We all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, whether the majority wants it or not, whether the majority likes what I do with my life or not. I have a right. So the only system, the only system, consistent with equal rights, with equal liberties, is capitalism. Socialism is, might generate equality of outcome, but it undermines, by definition, it undermines equality of freedoms, equality of rights. It's a violation of the principle of equality of, 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 of liberty. Well, I don't believe that income is perhaps surprising. I don't believe that income inequality in and of itself is the goal. The goal is equality and power. For us to, as political actors, have the same democratic states, for us to have certain guarantees that we'll be able to reach our individual potentials. It might be that in the society that I envision, if someone working at, at one firm wants to and, uh, work longer hours, is has a position of more responsibility, or is doing a really socially undesirable job that's still vital, like uh, sanitation workers or whatever else, they'd be compensated more than people in other, in other jobs. Um, that's not a problem unless it's connected to inequalities of power. Unless it means that this extra wealth that I have isn't just more spare time for me or more money for leisure or for trips or for whatever else, but in fact it means that I hold more power over, over you. And today, often when we talk on the left, more broadly, the populist left, or the socialist left, when people talk about income inequality and denounce it, often it's because it's correlated to these inequalities of power. Because in our society, if you have wealth and if you have power, you'll use that wealth and power to keep your foot on someone else's neck. You'll use that wealth and power. Naturally, it's not just these a cabal of crony capitalists. You'll naturally use that wealth and power to set up regulations and systems that keep you powerful and keep your, your, your competition behind. This isn't an aberration. This is a natural outgrowth of living in a class society. What I propose is going towards a society in which we have a free association of, of producers. Income inequality isn't the main problem. The problem that we have is inequalities rooted in the workplace and rooted in civil society. That's a product of capitalism. All right, uh, with that, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. It has to be Q and actual A, then. Uh, so if, if after a sentence, uh, after, after two yeah, you have a question, the side. then I'm not going to cut you off, really. Um, and also, just a reminder, I'm really excited that we're having a civil debate, so let's keep it civil. Hi, uh, I have a question for Mr. Brooke. So I was especially intrigued by this concept of a state of complete separation of the state and the economy. And what I was wondering is if you'd lay out for me how exactly a small state such as this could enforce this anti, these antitrust rules, especially in industries in which economies have scaled into the play. I don't believe it should be antitrust rules. That's exactly what I mean by a separation of state from economy. 
I don't, I think antitrust rules were the first great violation of individual, of, of, of economic rights in the United States in 1890. Uh, there are no such things as monopolies in free markets. And, and I'll take the classic examples, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I've, I've, uh, I've encouraged audiences to challenge me in this in hundreds of engagements, never found one yet. Um, Standard Oil. Standard Oil had 92% uh, of all the refining capacity in the United States in the 1870s. A monopoly, right? You'd expect a monopoly. What were you, what were you taught in Economics 101 monopolies do? They raise prices and they lower, and they lower quality. Well, go to the data. The data is available. It's all archived, and you'll find that the prices went down every single year. Quality went up dramatically every single year. And by the way, wages went up as well every single year, in spite of the monopoly power supposedly that Rockefeller had. Not only did, did prices not move in the way we expected, who ultimately competed Rockefeller out of the business that he was in? Because he ultimately got a zero market share in the market in the, in the market he was in in 1870. In the 1870s, he was producing what? Kerosene, which was used for lighting. Who competed in all of existence? Thomas Edison. Who would have predicted that? Which bureaucrat, which government entity would have predicted that Thomas Edison was actually a competitor of Rockefeller? And by the time antitrust laws broke Rockefeller up in the 1920s, how much of the percent of the oil market did Rockefeller have then? 23, I think, percent. So market competition drove him from 1923 and wiped out a whole industry for him by through you know, what we call an economic substitute product, electricity. So the idea that a bureaucrat, that a government, that voters, that a majority can figure out what a monopoly is and when it's appropriate and when it's not is absurd. And this is why the principle has to be, and I believe in principles, no government intervention in the economy. Not for antitrust, not for any other cause you or a bunch of economists might think is worthwhile. There is no cause worthwhile enough to violate somebody's property rights. All right. We'll take one from the side. And by the way, if you guys want to ask questions, it would be helpful if you head to the side over there. One so, so I should very quickly say that that, that has very little to do with the debate around around socialism. And I'm not Elizabeth Warren, I'm not in favor of, of, of necessarily every form of antitrust legislation. I think there's often efficiencies with economies of scale. Um, often, you, know, you saw in social democracies, the wage pressures from sectoral bargaining and social democracy led to the concentration in larger firms. Um, so, I don't know. Lots of, you answered lots of questions. questions. Yes, um, thank you very much. This has been very uh, fascinating. And I sake of transparency, I agree with both of you and I disagree with both of you, but I do have a question for Mr. Brook. So let's say you're living in Indiana and one of your friends is an entrepreneur opens up uh, a plant and needs energy. Uh, another entrepreneur friend of yours opens up a coal fire and coal plant. Um, as a result, you have arsenic and other heavy metals that are leaching in uh, radium, leaching into the water. You and your family drink that water, you get sick, you go to the doctor, and you don't get better because you find out the doctor's not actually a medical doctor or someone pretending. What's the remedy for all of that? Property rights. So if water is private property, and if you have recourse to the legal system where you can show that somebody has hurt you, we've always known you can't drop your garbage in my backyard. We've always known you can't poison me. That's in civil law going back a thousand years. Uh, the legal system takes care of that, and once a certain compound is proven to be destructive to human life, it's completely appropriate for the government to then step in in protection of the of life, of the right to life, and you say you can emit that product, right? But there has to be a process by which that is objectively defined. The legal system has always worked pretty well to do that. That's the system by which uh, you do that. But remember, I mean, let me just make a a general comment. People talk about the environment all the time, and, and you know, your generation is pretty depressed about the environment. The world's going to end in 12 years, or something like that. Life has never been as good as it is right now. You've never lived longer. You've never lived healthier. You've never uh, breathed uh, cleaner air. You've never drunk uh, uh, cleaner water. You know why they do tea in China? Because it used to be in ancient times that the water was polluted. They had to boil the water. One way to guarantee that was by, by drinking tea. Same about beer in Northern Europe. 
It's, we live in this amazing world. The human environment has never been better. Primarily because of the capitalist elements in society. So, these questions are easily dealt with in a, in a, in a property rights respecting capitalist system. By the way, the, the most dirty places in the world are socialists. Always have been. When the world, when the wall came down, Eastern Europe was filthy because nobody takes care of public property, but you take care of your property. So we want more of your property and less public property. All right, Mr. Sam Grip, Sam Carroll, would you please explain Venezuela's state of socialism? Well, well, first of all, on that point, I mean, these are also countries in Eastern Europe that didn't have democratic socialists or, or, or green parties uh, that had to, 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 to freely uh, enact the type of legislation that cleaned up uh, Western Europe and cleaned up these countries from the muck of, of the damage the Industrial Revolution did. It said they, they had their own Industrial Revolution, which, which left behind that, that, that party. When it comes to uh, Venezuela, Venezuela, in my mind, is, is not a socialist society. It, 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 it never was. It was a society that always maintained um, property rights. It, but it was a society that embodied, in many ways, uh, it came to embody the worst of both, both worlds. You had a um, systems of patronage that developed uh, from, from oil rents being, being trickled down. You had a populist style of mobilization used by all sectors of political parties in Venezuela. You had um, certain programs that were, in fact, uh, uh, misguided. Like you had a price control program, uh, which I think backfired uh, tremendously. So, in many cases, there, there were huge mistakes being done in, in, in Venezuela, and, and it's in an economic crisis that was worsened by continued U.S. sanctions, uh, by a violent opposition. It, it's a, it's a uh, disaster on many, on many levels. I don't think it reflects uh, one way or the other on, on socialism in, in, in particular. Now, if you have parties in, um, let's say, an, an actual socialist party governing within the confines of capitalism in Bolivia and in Ecuador, now, many people have complaints about the Morales government, they have complaints about the record of the Correa government, they have complaints about the first two terms of the PK uh, government in Brazil. But these were countries that were able to uh, preside over long periods of economic growth, they were able to redistribute the proceeds of that growth to create stronger social infrastructure, social indicators went way up. So I think you saw during the same time the successes of left of center government in Latin America, as you saw the decline of Venezuela under Maduro. So I think at a certain level we have to say that certain factors are in fact contingent. I wouldn't sit here and claim that a capitalist is responsible, uh, someone on the pro-capitalist side, is, is responsible for defending the systems that we saw under Pinochet in Chile, in the same way we could say that socialist and egalitarian and redistributive systems uh, and, and left populist systems in particular can lead in very, very dark directions or they can lead towards further progress and emancipation. You saw both at the same time in the same continent. So, uh, so I think we need to make clear that we're, we're for certain bedrock social um, uh, rights that need to be combined with political rights. We're for free press. We're for, uh, we're against government authority in any context, no matter who's using it no matter what flag they're, they're flying. So let this be very clear, Venezuela is clearly a failure of socialism. If you look at industry by industry, the industries that failed in Venezuela are those that we either nationalize or collectivize. Farming in Venezuela, which used to be private, and at that point Venezuela was an exporter of food, was nationalized, creating communes that made decisions about what to grow and how to grow it, and as a consequence, food production has plummeted. Now, this is the case everywhere that you collectivize farms, from the kibbutz to Mao's China to the Ukraine. Everywhere where farming has been collectivized, the result has been starvation. The oil industry, which elements of it used to be private, were nationalized by Chavez, and as a consequence, a country that has more oil reserves than Saudi Arabia is now has no oil can get to the oil because it doesn't have the technology and the ability because it collectivized them. So it's exactly because of socialism that Venezuela failed. Now true, they didn't collectivize everything, 
And those parts that they didn't collectivize are still somehow functioning. And why Venezuela still doesn't have tens of millions of people dying of starvation, just hundreds of thousands of people dying of starvation. You emphasized a lot about uh, capitalism being set up on a source of individual freedom, happiness, and rights. But you recognize that society is made up of individuals who pursue their rights in different ways. Some go to extremes, disregarding the effects that their choices cause to other members of the society. So without a uniform or without an unpartisan uh, regulatory body, how do you govern such like a situation where some individuals with extremist ideas exist? Thank you. So I don't follow with people having extremist ideas. I don't. I think a lot of people think I have extremist ideas, uh, and, and it worries me when people want to silence people with extremist ideas because I would be one of the first silenced. Um, it's not your ideas that worry me; it's your actions. If your actions violate people's rights, and again, violation of rights is poisoning their water, violating their rights is, you know, stealing from them, violating their property rights, or, or, or harming them physically, or committing fraud against them. Those things, you put them in jail. We both, you know, those are, those are the laws that a capitalist society passes because they're laws that protect individual rights. But everything else, it's up to you. As long as you're not violating other people's rights, you can do what you want. You can start a company and build a business. You can become an employee. You can decide you don't want to work and you can, uh, you know, be a panhandler outside. You can choose what you want to do. And it's your life. I don't have to help you if you made bad choices. I don't have to help you if you're out of luck. I can choose to help you if I want to. And I can choose not to help you if I don't want to. So any help, any uh, what do you call it, safety net, is voluntary. Every interaction between human beings should be voluntary. I, I'm, it's very simple. Capitalism is very simple. It's a system in which we interact with one another voluntarily. We don't pull guns out. We don't collect little gangs to, to, to vote, to take your property or to take your stuff away from you. We just, each individual, interact with other people on a voluntary basis. And if I don't want to deal with you for whatever reason, I don't deal with you. I walk away. So I actually I want to get your answer to that question too because I think it's a good one. How would a socialist system deal with extremist ideas? Well, I think by much the same the same standard, the level of um, you know, if if you're presenting an immediate harm or physical threat, if you're inciting people to to violence, uh, then no. But if you're just marching down the street with a uh, swastika and whatever else, I think we have to trust that the vast majority of people will not go down that that path. You know, today it's not illegal to start a, uh, a monarchist party in the United States. Uh, there's no monarchist party because very few people want to get rid of uh, a democratic republic. And I, I think the standard has to be a very high standard for state intervention um, in, in stopping, you know, um, so-called extremism and whatnot. And I think the standard has to be direct incitement to, to harm and, and, and violence. All right, well, we are unfortunately out of time for more questions. Um, I'm going to kick this off to the gentlemen to give closing statements. And then I'm really interested to see if they change their mind. I want you to see the closing statements and take more questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe we can okay. take two at a time. We'll take two or yeah. yeah. two, two, two at a time. So you get one and you get one. Well, let's, let's do four and we'll choose what to answer. Okay. <laughs> That'll be a closing statement. Let's do four, four, four questions straight. No, you don't get I don't believe you. All right, two for each side. My question is: I wanted, I, I, at the beginning, you defined some terms like what socialism is and what capitalism is. I think even more fundamental is that you should define what we mean by rights, because um, the definition of rights as being you know, a right to education means that somebody else's rights have to be violated. You have to take... So yes, the question is what is rights? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. <laughs> I, I did define them, by the way. And over here. Yeah, that, that was about my question, but to just go off of that, I was wondering if you agree with the idea of positive, if you happen to agree with the idea of positive rights, which requires somebody else's labor or someone else's 
actions. Um, how do you justify that given how that might come to Just have closing statements on rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two more questions. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, yeah, I wrote that it is the role of government to protect our freedom. And yet you also uh, uh, admit that it's a, the, the nature of government or nature of the state is to, uh, uh, is that a coercion and that one of, uh, of violence? How can you expect an institution that is inherently violent to protect our rights? So an anarchy question. Always get one in every event that was there. Yes. Um, um, in the world of nations, I would say argue that uh, the role of the government was to regulate the market forces. Because I believe you understood that there was a limit to market forces and they needed to be regulated. So then my question would be, if we do get rid of regulations and we um, get rid of the government, assuming that you can have, you can have a functional economy or functional capitalist society with a small government, um, how do you ensure that we do not um, fall into a system that um, the political scientists show the world would call inverted totalitarianism, whereas you have the inverse of classical totalitarianism where the corporations capture the state and we live under the tyranny of the corporations instead of the tyranny of the government. All right, you each have two minutes. I should start. I guess you started. Yeah, you, you go ahead and start. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so let me just quickly do the rights question. I mean, I said in my opening statement, the rights are the recognition that we have the freedom to act in pursuit of our values. That's what a right is, and that's what I defined it early on. They cannot be positive rights in that sense. I think rights are positive. The positive nature of action, that is, they, they, they um, sanction your ability to act on behalf of your life in pursuit of your values, in pursuit of, of your, you know, your rational mind. So in that sense, they're positive. But this is the principle with rights. You cannot have a right to other people's stuff. You can't, this is, any time you think there's a right, but it requires taking stuff from other people, it can't be a right. You can't have other people working for you. We call that slavery without compensation. You can't have a right to health care. That makes the doctor, the nurses, the whole, you know, all the people who have worked hard and educated themselves and, and, and everything in order to provide a product, a service. They become your slaves. They have to provide it to you without any compensation because you have a right to it. So you cannot have a right to other people's stuff. The only right you have is to be left alone. In other words, the only right you have is to be free of coercion, free to act in pursuit of your own values. And I'll just say quickly in the last question, I, you know, this idea that somehow corporations will take over the state. The state has guns. Uh, corporations don't. Uh, the state is the monopoly over the use of force. And if you separate state from economics, corporations are about making money, creating values, producing stuff. They're not about political power. And if you leave them alone, they will leave you alone. And if, they, if a corporation doesn't, then you use the power of the state to stop them. That is, if they are violating rights, if they are using force against citizens, or if they are using force against the government, then the government has every right to stand up and stop them. Well, well, corporations not too long ago used to have guns. And the Pinkertons ran a month in this country and killed workers and decided law in its own terms. And corporations still had guns, but being the state after that in the 20th century. Look at what U.S. Fruit did in Latin America. U.S. corporations have always had guns. This, this, this is the natural dynamics of what happens if you allow concentration of wealth and power in a so-called private sphere and will spill over. Now, when it comes to the kind of rights and freedoms that we want to see, yes, I, I believe strongly in our negative freedoms. I believe strongly in the Bill of Rights. I also believe that there needs to be a second Bill of Rights. And in this, I share with not just democratic socialists, but also with the best of American liberalism that share the same belief. From FDR's uh, a speech in 1944 onward, there's been demands for a certain bedrock of guarantees and a certain bedrock of rights. But yes, I agree, it does mean taking away something from someone else or from another group of people. I think there's limits to what one can take 
from someone else. You can't abridge someone's speech. You can't take someone's life. There's all sorts of limits. But taking someone's right to provide you, your HMO's right to provide you with health insurance, and turning that into a social guarantee, that's, that's a right that I'm, I'm more, than, more than happy to, to take away. And in this vision of society you have, you know, I, I think it just doesn't jive with what most people think, which is that you know, you're, it's not about altruism or whatever else. Most people want to take care of themselves and take care of their families. And they're seeing themselves get squeezed at every moment. They're seeing an establishment of both the left and the right, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, we take them for granted, take their votes for granted, they say, you know what, I just need a little bit more relief. I need a little bit more freedom to do what I want and not have to worry about my medical debt, not have to worry about how I'm going to pay to send my kid to school. I need to not worry about whether this banker writing me a mortgage is trying to rip me off. This is what people want. And this is why I don't know if socialism is that well. I don't know if socialism will, will work, but I do know that social democracy is the path that most Americans believe in, and it's a path that America is going to march into in the next 10, 20 years. All right. Um, well, with that, I want to know what you guys think. So, who here still supports capitalism? Who, uh, who supports socialism and put up both your names of your convert? All right, uh, who's still undecided? Great. Well, uh, give these gentlemen a round of applause.